A very good morning to everybody. I uh, wish to thank the organizers for having uh, me and my wife here for this uh, wonderful uh, conference. And uh, thank you, Binil and Shashi, for chairing the session. Uh, I'll be talking about the physiologically difficult airway. Not really an emerging concept. It's now, I think, uh, quite established, but a relatively new concept on the horizon. So all of us, uh, from the day we join anesthesia, are trained to identify anatomical difficulties in securing the airway. And the focus of airway management has traditionally been on anatomical factors that would make the establishment of a definitive airway difficult, maybe in the form of uh, face mask ventilation, laryngoscopy, ventilation using a supraglottic airway device, tracheal intubation, extubation, or an emergency surgical access from the front of the neck. Now, we are trained to look for all this because we know that we are the primary airway managers and we could always go wrong if we don't identify an anatomical uh, red flag, we might have a problem in securing the airway. Now, these challenges are partly overcome presently because we have a lot of equipment. The last two or three decades have seen a lot of uh, development, not only in uh, anesthetic or uh, anesthetic machines and drugs or pharmacology, but also in specifically in airway equipment, which have helped us overcome the, pro the anatomical issues with a difficult airway. Uh, we have also identified how to better pre-oxygenate our patients, the various techniques for pre-oxygenation, which has effectively prolonged the apnea time before we put in a definitive airway. So that is what is the definition of an anatomically difficult airway, which has been ingrained in us from the time we join anesthesia. A physiologically difficult airway uh, is uh, something that is... Uh, uh, wrong with the physiology of the patient. It could be a critically ill patient. It could be a patient who has uh, some physiological condition, maybe like pregnancy, a child in obesity. They have physiological changes that would come in the way of our securing a definitive airway, which means that by the time you get a device into the patient which will oxygenate your patient, you may have physiological hurdles which you may have to overcome, and we'll talk about this in more detail, which is the focus of this uh, lecture. Now, they can also be situationally difficult airway, which means that you have all the equipment available, you have all the, uh, you know, expertise available, you know your patient in and out. However, the situation or the, the place where you're intubating your patient may be not what you're used to. It may be in the emergency room, it may be in the ICU, and this is the third situation where you can have a situationally difficult airway. Now, physiologically difficult airway, the underlying physiological derangements that place are this is uh, essentially a situation that uh, uh, the, the physiological derangements that pre are present in the patient, they can lead to a higher risk of a cardiovascular collapse and arrest during or immediately after airway approach and conversion to IPPV. And that immediately means within the next uh, 60 seconds uh, following, uh, 60 uh, minutes following the securing of an airway. Now, as I already said, Physiological changes are there in certain patient subsets, like pregnancy, obesity, and pa the pediatric patient, that in addition add on physiological problems in the procurement of an airway. Now, you can see the paper by De Jong et al. They have identified predictors of cardiac arrest in a physiologically difficult airway, and that is five of these that are listed on the slide. Pre-intubation hypotension, pre-intubation hypoxemia that's present in a patient, an obese individual, non-performance of pre-oxygenation. For some reason, you're in an emergency situation. You do not have the time to adequately pre-oxygenate your patient. And an age more than 75 years, all of which are predictors for the occurrence of a cardiac arrest immediately after you secure the airway. Now, we have several scoring systems to identify an anatomically difficult airway. And the Makocha score is one score that is used for identifying a physiologically difficult airway. And here you can see there are three subclasses anatomical aspects, physiological aspects, and operator-related aspects. In the anatomical aspects, you have the uh, Malapati class 3 and 4, presence of obstructive sleep apnea, decreased cervical mobility, a mouth opening less than 3 centimeters, all of which are anatomical factors that uh, contribute to the physiological difficulty in securing the airway. Physiological concepts or aspects such as a Glasgow Coma score of less than 8, and a severe pre-existing hypoxemia, like in an ICU patient with an SpO2 less than 80%, and operator-related aspects, either a uh, not inadequately trained anesthesiologist or a non-anesthesiologist, for example, an emergency medicine person or an intensivist from the physician background trying to intubate a patient in the intensive care unit. Uh, we all know that most of uh, us consider 
ourselves as the best airway managers in the hospital. And if a non-anesthesiologist performs that, there are more chances of a uh, problem occurring. So the MACOCHA score uh, rolls into one score, anatomical aspects, physiological aspects, and operator related aspects, and the total score is 12. And anything that gets close to 12 means it's a very difficult physiologically as well as anatomically difficult airway to secure. Now, what are the specific physiological derangements that one needs to keep in mind or identify to, to uh, warn us that you may have a physiological difficulty in securing the airway, which means in the first, during the act of procuring the airway or soon after, you may have a complication, which may very often be a cardiac arrest, a hypotension, and so on and so forth. So the specific physiological derangements we need to keep in mind are pre-existing hypoxemia, hypotension, right ventricular failure, pre-existing metabolic acidosis, and the risk of aspiration. Now, the first four, as you can see, is very likely to occur in critically ill patients when you're dealing with the ICU patients. And that is a situation also where you are intubating a patient in a not very familiar surroundings, like your operation theater. The, operation, the, uh, table, the bed height is very low. You are in a clutter of a ventilator, a suction machine, a patient monitor. You often have to bend very low in order to intubate your patient. You don't have experience, other experienced people to help you or assist you during intubation. So situationally also, that becomes a difficult uh, problem. And of course, the risk of aspiration. Somebody who's taken up with a full stomach or has to be intubated in an emergency with a full stomach also contributes to a physiological derangement. Let's see the first one, hypoxemia. In a critically ill patient, the commonest cause of hypoxemia is an intrapulmonary shunt or a ventilation perfusion mismatch. And this is the commonest mechanism of producing hypoxemia in a critically ill patient. Now, increasing FiO2 may not improve the oxygenation to as great an extent as we expect in a normal individual. Because when you talk about a shunt, you, you expect that the venous blood goes into that particular alveolus and gets through onto the arterial side without getting oxygenated. And that's the definition of an intrapulmonary shunt. So patients with intrapulmonary shunt do not necessarily have an improvement in oxygenation uh, with conventional methods of oxygenation. So the best approach in these situations is to use a positive pressure alveolar recruitment, which means you apply a positive pressure to the airway, open up the alveolus, and then it becomes a functional alveolus after that. So that any blood flowing from the venous, cap venous end of the capillary to the arterial end of the capillary will now get oxygenated because you have essentially opened up the alveolus using a positive pressure alveolar recruitment maneuver. Hypoxemia is also the commonest reason for peri-intubation cardiac arrest in critically ill patients. You may uh, find, uh, you know, uh, staff and uh, postgraduate discussing that everything was, you know, okay. Suddenly the patient deteriorated, we intubated, and soon after that, the patient had a cardiac arrest. There's nothing uh, secret about this. Now we have identified the reason why this happens. Now, on this slide, you have uh, four uh, slopes, so to say. Along the x-axis, you have the time in minutes, the time to oxygen desaturation. And along the y-axis, you have the actual oxygen saturation values. At the top end of this y line, you have around 100% saturation. And the bottom end is around 60%. So the graph A indicates a normal adult. Where following uh, you know, adequate oxygenation, the time taken for critical oxygen desaturation is roughly around 10 minutes. If you follow this particular graph, A, it comes down to about almost 10 minutes. So an adequately oxygenated normal adult takes almost 9 to 10 minutes to desaturate. The same is not true for an obese individual, where you find that the obese individual is B and starts off with a close to 100% saturation, but desaturates very quickly, within 3 to 4 minutes. A child, for same reasons, is around four to five minutes. And a critically ill patient starts off at a much lower saturation and desaturates much faster. So the point I want to drive home on this slide is that a critically ill individual is at a physiological disadvantage and is considered to be a physiologically difficult airway. But the second point of hypotension, pre-existing hypotension uh, also is a risk factor for the development of uh, post-intubation cardiac arrest in the critically ill, physiologically difficult airway. The pre-existing decreased peripheral vascular resistance may be exacerbated by pharmacologically induced sympathalysis. We use some drug to uh, sedate the patient. We may even paralyze the patient and we will then uh, you know, transit to posture pressure ventilation. The use of drugs, pharmacological effects of these drugs can also worsen a pre-existing hypotension. Now, how do we identify such individuals? 
Patients are in overt shock, we can identify easily, but you can also look at what's called the shock index, which is nothing but the ratio of the heart rate to the systolic blood pressure. Now, if that value is more than 0.8, it increases the risk of post-induction hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, and even cardiac arrest. So that's the second factor we need to identify to identify physiologically difficult airway. Peri-intubation hypotension occurs within the first 60-minute period following intubation, and one of these three events needs to be kept in mind. A systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury, and the need to administer a vasopressor. All these indicate that this patient is having a peri-intubation hypotension. The third factor that we needed to identify to tell us that this patient is having a physiologically difficult airway is the presence of right ventricular failure. And with point-of-care ultrasound nowadays, we can do a careful screening, we can do an echocardiography, and on-site you can identify right ventricular dysfunction or right ventricular failure. Now we know that when we administer positive pressure ventilation, the pressure within the, uh, the lungs increases, and this is transmitted back onto the right heart. So a patient who is having a right ventricular dysfunction or a right ventricular failure does not tolerate intermittent positive pressure well. So uh, also add to this the presence of hypoxemia and hypercarbia, which can worsen during a, uh, an attempt to secure an airway, and this could further worsen a right ventricular function. So we need to identify patients who are having a right ventricular dysfunction or failure and treat them with caution and be prepared for a peri-intubation sudden drastic drop in uh, physiological parameters including a possible cardiac arrest. The fourth condition is metabolic acidosis. Presence of metabolic acidosis either in the form of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or any other form of metabolic or in uh, kidney disease, patients with pre-existing metabolic acidosis are likely to be having a compensatory hyperventilation. They are trying to uh, compensate for the drop in pH by hyperventilating and try to raise their pH by creating a respiratory alkalosis. Now, even a very brief period of apnea in such patients, which we create during intubation, could worsen the acidosis. So again, be wary of uh, intubating a patient who is having a metabolic acidosis. And the final parameter is the risk of aspiration. Fatal aspiration has been known to occur in one out of 350 thousand anesthetics and accounts for 50 percent of anesthetic related deaths and that's that's a larger quite a large number to remember so be careful when you're dealing with patients with who have a risk of aspiration these are patients with full stomach delayed gastric emptying due to either pregnancy trauma critical illness diabetes or intestinal obstruction all these can pose additional physiological challenges during intubation i already mentioned that there are certain subsets of patients like the obese individual, the pregnant individual, and the pediatric patient. We won't have time to go into the details, but all of these do have a physiologically uh, compromised airway. They have a physiologically difficult airway to deal with. So be wary when you deal with these three categories of patients. Now, how do we, the, the bottom line is we need to improve the oxygenation. We need to improve the oxygen reserves in these physiologically uh, difficult airway patients so that we don't land up in a catastrophic event following the securing of an airway. So we need to look at various methods by which we can oxygenate our patient. Conventionally, all of us start the anesthetic in the operating room by pre-oxygenating our patient with a reasonably tight-fitting mask and a flow of five to six or maybe 10 liters of um, oxygen per minute. That is one method of pre-oxygenating, but in a non-operating theater environment, one makes use of what's called a non-rebreathing mask, which is nothing but a mask with a reservoir hanging from the bottom, and you feed in about 10 to 15 liters of oxygen through this brown tubing that's going in here. The excess oxygen collects in the reservoir bag and always acts to improve the FiO2 that the patient is breathing. So that's one method of doing it. Nasal cannulas available uni universally in all operating rooms, all intensive care units, and all emergency rooms. So we can give oxygen at a rate of 10 to 15 liters per minute right from the time you see a critically ill patient. And the nasal cannula is a fairly good enough uh, method to pre-oxygenate our patients. In situations where that will not help, or if you're working in a better setup, you're dealing with a very critically ill patient, you can use high-flow nasal oxygen, which uses uh, anywhere between 50 to 70 liters per minute of humidified uh, oxygen, 100% uh, oxygen, and uh, you can uh, keep not only the oxygen reserves built up in these patients, but because of the way these devices work, they also wash out carbon dioxide from the upper airways, as hypercarbia can also be avoided. Going one step further, when you're dealing with a critically ill patient who is very dependent on a, a ventilatory support, 
we often have patients on a non-invasive ventilatory support before we transit onto a conventional intermittent posture pressure ventilation on a uh, invasive type of ventilation. So in these patients, you can continue using the non-invasive ventilator with a tight-fitting mask. You can also add on a nasal cannula under the, uh, the, the non-invasive mask, which will further supplement the oxygen you are giving to the patient. And the advantage of the non-invasive posture pressure ventilation is that because of the tight fit of the mask, you're actually creating a CPAP effect. You're opening up the alveoli. And if you remember what I said earlier, by creating a positive pressure within the airways, you are making many more collapsed alveoli functional and you're reducing the intrapulmonary shunt. So this is one very uh, uh, scientific way of improving oxygenation in a critically ill patient in whom the problem is more of a, venti a ventilation perfusion mismatch, uh, primarily an intrapulmonary shunt. So the various techniques of oxygenation have been summarized here. Pre-oxygenation with a well-fitting face mask with oxygen at 5 liters per minute. For, uh, for three to five minutes is what we normally do in the operating room. A non-rebreathing mask, white board nasal prongs, uh, nasal ca uh, cannulae, high flow nasal oxygen, the HFNOs, non-invasive posture pressure ventilation. And the last one is an extra glottic device. Sometimes you find that uh, patients uh, who have uh, an obstructive airway, patients who are having a bronchospasm, patients who have a stiff lung, they very often require high pressures to, to uh, ventilate the patient. In such kind of patients, you may even have to place an extra glottic device, like a supraglottic airway device, temporarily, till you are able to secure a definitive airway. Now, all of this can be summarized in the last few slides uh, as a structured approach to a physiologically difficult airway. We just talked about pre-oxygenation. The, the next step that we need to remember is the sequence of induction. Do we do a rapid sequence induction or do we do a, what's called a delayed sequence induction? What are the pharmacological options available to Make it comfortable for the patient while you're securing a physiologically difficult airway. What's the choice of laryngoscope that is uh, appropriate? And what do we do for hemodynamic optimization? And we'll try and cover each of these. Pre-oxygenation is best done in a head-up ramped position or a reverse Trendelenburg position. We know that when you put a patient in a reverse Trendelenburg position, the diaphragm, the pressure on the diaphragm is removed and the diaphragm moves better. And that basically increases the FRC and makes our oxygen reserves even better in the lungs. It also decreases the risk of aspiration. Now we use rapid sequence induction when you have a problem with the full stomach, when there's a risk of aspiration. The other thing that's come into the, in the horizon now is what's called delayed sequence intubation. Many of our critically ill patients are quite agitated. It'll be very difficult to, you may have need one or two people to hold a mask onto the patient's face. So now what they've described is what's called a delayed sequence induction where you can use small doses of either ketamine or dexmedetomidine to quieten your patient. And then the subsequent pre-oxygenation becomes much more effective. And that's called delayed sequence intubation. Pharmacological options, ketamine is good because it maintains the blood pressure. Etomidate, again, is cardiovascularly stable. So it is much better than propofol or thiopentone that we use because these are drugs. Propofol and thiopentone can drop the blood pressure. And we already know that Pre-intubation hypotension is one of the risk factors for the development of peri-intubation hypotension. Muscle relaxants do improve the first pass intubation success, but occasionally we may have to take recourse to spontaneously breathing patient in an awake state in order to secure the airway. What about the choice of the laryngoscope? Depending on the place where you work, depending on your expertise, if you are used to a conventional laryngoscope, by all means use what you're used to. But I think slowly we are moving towards the video laryngoscope as a preferred device in all difficult airways. Awake fiber optic aided intubation under topical anesthesia in a spontaneous breathing patient is preferred in a critically ill patient, especially uh, you know, uh, when they have a physiologically difficult airway. About hemodynamic assessment by the bedside, uh, Panka just referred to the, ultra, the, uh, the point of uh, care ultrasound in order to identify cardiovascular function. Fluid resuscitation is very essential in a hypovolemic patient, but it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes some critically ill patients may not tolerate a fluid load. They may be fluid unresponsive. And then you may have to give vasopressors to, to tackle the situation. You can either use an infusion of noradrenaline or dilute boluses of phenylephrine or adrenaline to contract the drug-induced hypotension. So in summary, I'd like to say that we made a difference between an anatomically difficult airway and a situationally difficult airway and finally we focused on what's called the physiologically difficult airway which essentially is an airway that uh, that uh, gives you physiological hurdles 
on your way to securing a definitive airway. How do you predict a physiologically difficult airway? We talked about the Makocha score, which identifies several parameters, and it will help us to identify a patient who is likely to have a physiologically difficult airway. We looked at the specific physiological derangements, and uh, to, to identify them, there were hypoxemia, hypotension, right ventricular failure, metabolic acidosis at the risk of aspiration. We looked at various techniques of oxygenation, and uh, then we described a structured approach to patients with a physiologically difficult airway. Uh, my sincere thanks once again to the organizing committee of the ISA South Zone PG Assembly and ISA Midgon 23. In particular, Shamshad, Murli Dharan, Brijesh, Anand, and Srijit. Not the others are not important, but the team is important. But these are the names I wanted to specifically thank. Thank you very much. Thank you for sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Ramakumar sir has an ability to make all complicated uh, problems, sim uh, pr pr uh, topics simple. This time also he did so. We are honored to have uh, you in this conference with your wife. Actually, he was a part of uh, all academic activities of Kerala. On the behalf of organizing committee, I once again thank you, sir. That thank topic, you, sir. It's thank a you, golden opportunity to clear your doubt. Because of shortage of time, <laughs> one question can be asked. Otherwise, you can clear your doubts in the uh, tea time. Is there any questions? Doubts? Yes, madam. So uh, just one clarification. You said that in patients in whom uh, pre-oxygenation was suboptimal, you would... Uh, in patients in whom pre-oxygenation? Is suboptimal or difficult okay. to achieve. You okay. would use a supraglottic airway device until you reached your uh, point of intubation. Correct. Correct. So uh, would you actually be able to put an LMA in a patient whom you were not able to oxygenate well and then try oxygenation through it till you... Is that what you were trying to say? Or was it something like a nasopharyngeal airway which would remove a tongue obstruction? No, no. I was unclear about uh, what you were trying no, to say. It is primarily a supra, the conventional supraglottic airway and it's specifically useful in patients in whom you, they have a uh, high airway pressure. You need to generate a high airway pressure in order to uh, create oxygen. adequate gas exchange. Now, that is not possible with conventional method. I mean, you can't do that with okay. the conventional methods of oxygenation. So, in that case, you try, of course, the NIPPV. And if that also fails, you might have to have a transient period where you okay. can place a supraglottic airway, reorganize yourself, and then, uh, you know, uh, through that, you get your because we know that supraglottic airway. airways have a, you know, seal pressure of roughly around 20, 25 centimeters of water. So that would be enough to oxygenate your patient for that period of time. So it is literally what we use in the operation theater, the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned about the uh, laryngoscopes uh, preferred for the physiological difficulty airway. So, uh, what will be the preferred uh, tools for uh, COVID patients? For? COVID patients in physiological difficulty airway. Usual protection of the individual, of course. Right? So, and video, then a video laryngoscope, I think, is better yeah. because you, you can have the vision on the screen and you can keep the physical distance from the patient. So, video laryngoscope, again, would be a better choice in a COVID patient. Thank you, sir. Of course, you need to be used yeah. used to it. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, many centers may not even have it as of now. But and when you get it, you don't use it routinely. But I think a time will come when routinely we'll be using a video laryngoscope, and then we'll become yeah. more adept at it. But to answer your question, a, a, a video laryngoscope is more useful. Thank you, sir. So, if there is no more questions, we will wind up the session.